This is your Chapter 7 Create the Test Review. Number 1. To get ready for a spring break, break camping trip, Jennifer is planning to buy a new backpack. First, she has, decide, has to decide if it should be an internal frame or an external frame. Then she has to decide the size between 26 or 36 pounds. And finally, she has to decide if it should have a removable day pack or a no day pack. So you'll notice that I've highlighted all those options in different colors. I do this just so I can visually see the difference between all those, so all my options. Create a sample space list to help Jennifer see all the possible options. So remember, we're creating a list, not a tree diagram. So I'm just gonna start with the internal frame. If I bought an internal frame, with that, I could buy a 26 pound uh, bag and a removable day pack, or I could get another internal frame with a 26 pound, that's 26 pounds, or has a no day pack. I could also buy an internal frame that has a 36 pound, or that's 36 pounds, excuse me, with a removable day pack, or I can get an internal frame that's 36 pounds with a no day pack. Okay? So I did the internal frame for each weight, and for each weight I have the different kinds of day packs. All right, so now we're gonna do the same thing for the external frame. I can get an external frame that's 26 pounds with a removable day pack, or an external frame that's 26 pounds with a no day pack. I can get an external frame that's 36 pounds with a removable day pack, or an external frame that's 36 pounds with no day pack. So, I feel like I completed all of my possible um, sample space list, but the way I wanna double check this is by figuring out um, my sample space, like what, how many options should I have? So I have two here, I have two for the blue, and then I have two for the yellow. And two times two times two is eight. So I should have eight possible options. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I do, so I know that my sample space list should be complete. Number two, Elise is planning to build a new custom entertainment center for her friend. She has the following choices to decide upon. So she's got design is open or closed, shells, two, three, or four. Wood can be oak or poplar, and the finish is gonna be paint or stain. So four options. It says, how many possible configurations does Elise have for her final product? Hint, use the counting principle. Well, this, what we did up here, is the counting principle. So it's taking all the possible options and multiplying them together. So for the yellow, I have two options, so two. Shelves, I have three options. Wood, I have two options. And finish is two options. So the counting principle says I multiply all these together. Two times three is six. Six times two is 12. And 12 times two is 24. So I have a total of 24 possible options. Sorry, that answer should go right here. Number three. Given the sample space below, so we're looking at this sample space right here, the heads, 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 tails, etc. Describe the coin flip experiment. So how many, can, what was the number of coins we were using? Well, this is like an example experiment right here. I hit flip the heads, then another heads, then another heads. So that's one, two, three coins. I need to know if it was a compound or a simple event. So compound means multiple things are happening. So one, two, there were three things happening. A simple event would just be one. So since there are three things happening here, it's a compound event. And then I need to know if it's dependent or independent. Well, the way I remember this is um, I, like Mrs. Clickman, is an, I'm an independent. I do not depend on my parents for things. Um, you, as a student, are still dependents. You depend on your parents for things. Um, like a house, get you from point A to point B, food, stuff like that. So that's how I remember what those two words mean. So when I'm looking at my sample space over here and the experiment that's happening, I have to ask myself, does the next coin flip depend on what 
I flipped the first time. Well, what I flipped the second time does not depend on what I flipped the first time. So since it does not depend on it, it is an independent event. Independent event. It's independent. It does not depend on it. This heads doesn't depend on this heads. This heads doesn't depend on this heads or that one, vice versa. So it's independent. All right, flipping it over. Number four on the back. Create a sample space tree diagram. Okay, that's important. That shows the possible outcomes for the following survey. Number one on the front, we were creating a sample space list. This needs to be an actual tree diagram. Okay, so what candy do you prefer? M&Ms or Skittles? What donuts do you prefer? Dunkin' Donuts or Krispy Kreme? And then what dessert do you prefer? Ice cream or pie? So I'm gonna start with my yellows. Here's my, I'm gonna start with M&Ms. And I'm gonna put Skittles over here. So there's my yellows. If I get M&Ms, with M&Ms I can either get Dunkin' Donuts or Krispy Kreme. Oops, wrong way. So I can get Dunkin' Donuts or Krispy Kreme. If I get Dunkin' Donuts, then with Dunkin' Donuts, I can either get ice cream or pie. So ice cream or pie. Same thing with Krispy Kreme. If I pick Krispy Kreme, I can either get ice cream or pie. So that's my sample space for M&Ms, or my sample space tree diagram. So let's do the same thing with Skittles. If I get Skittles, I can either get Dunkin' Donuts or Krispy Kreme. If I get Dunkin' Donuts, I can get ice cream or pie. If I get Krispy Kreme, I can get ice cream or pie. So if we remember the counting principle, let's just double check. There's two here, two options here, and two options here. And two times two times two is eight. So I should have a total of eight possible outcomes. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I do, so we should be good. Let's just double check. I've used my M&Ms and my Skittles. Dunkin' Donuts, Krispy Kreme, and then I've got ice cream pie, ice cream pie, ice cream pie, ice cream pie. So I made sure I have one of each of those. Number five, you are given a box of dry erase markers containing one each of blue, black, green, and red. I like these in different colors. Sorry, I don't have the exact colors. That's okay. And then red. So I'm going to create a sample space tree diagram. That's important. So just like we did up here, it shows the possible outcomes for selecting two markers without replacement. So that's super important. So let's see. If I pick a blue, so here's my colors. I'm going to start with blue. If I pick a blue, my and I don't replace it without replacement, I take it away. What is the possible options for the second choice? Well, I've got these three colors, which I've highlighted up here, is black, green, and red. So I could get black, I could get green, or I could get red. Okay? Um, let's do our second option, which I have highlighted yellow here, but that's going to be black. Sorry, I should say this is blue. Black. If I pick black, which I have highlighted yellow, sorry, I have these three options left for my second draw. So the blue, I could get blue, I could get um, green, or I could get red. Sorry if those colors are confusing you. All right, putting that one back. The next number I'm gonna move to, number, excuse me, color is gonna be green. So that's everything that's highlighted pink on here. So I'm going to take the pink out. If I pull a green the first time and I don't replace it, then those are my only three options for my second pull. So that comes from blue, black, and then red. Okay, so I took the green out, so I've got blue, black, and red left. And then last but not least is the red. So I have red highlighted that color. So if I take red out, the only options I have left are those three. So that is blue, black, and green. Blue, black, and green. 
those three colors match. Okay. So that is my sample space tree diagram for this scenario. All right, number six. Your family decides to go to Chick-fil-A for lunch next Saturday. Use the counting principle to quickly figure out how many possible lunch outcomes you could choose from this list. So I have six different sandwiches, 13 different sides, eight different desserts, and 12 different drinks. And what I'm gonna do with the counting principle is take all those options and multiply them together. So six times 13 times eight times 12. So six times 13, six times three is 18. Six times one plus one is seven. So that's 78. Let's multiply that by eight. 78 times eight. Eight times eight is 64. Eight times seven is 56. Plus six is 62. So this is 624, and now I'm going to multiply that by 12. So 624 times 12, 2 times 4 is 8, 2 times 2 is 4, 2 times 6 is 12. Add a 0. 1 times 4 is 4, 1 times 2 is 2, and 1 times 6 is 6. I'm going to add down. 8 plus 0 is 8, 4 plus 4 is 8, 2 plus 2 is 4, and 1 plus 6 is 7. So I have 7,488 different options. Number seven, you're given a bag of marbles containing seven yellow, three blue, six black, 10 orange, and 14 red. What is the probability that you randomly pull out a black marble? So first off, remember probability of a simple event. So this is one thing, I'm pulling out one thing here. It's gonna be the, um, the probability uh, is going to be the number of desired over the number of possible. So the number of desired outcomes over the number of possible. So I desire to pick a black marble. Well, there are six black marbles. So the probability of picking a black, sorry, is going to be six out of the number of possible. Well, the number of possible is all these marbles that are in the bag. So seven plus three is 10, 10 plus six is 16, plus 10 is 26, plus 14 is 40. So seven plus three plus six plus 10 plus 14 equals 40. That way you know where we got that from, okay? All right, so 40 total. So I need to express this answer as a percent. Well, first off, let's simplify it because simplifying gets us smaller numbers and we like math with smaller numbers. So let's divide both of these by two. Half of six is three and half of 40 is 20. I cannot simplify anymore, so now I need to change this fraction to a decimal. So what we're gonna do first is change it, I'm sorry, you need to change this fraction to a percent. So the first thing we're gonna do is change it to a decimal. The way we change fractions to decimals is by doing tie up, top in, bottom out. 20 will not go into three, so I'm gonna add a decimal, take it up into zero. 20 will go into 30 one time. Minus 20 is 10, add zero, bring it down, and 20 goes into 100 five times exactly. So I have 0.15, and to re remember to change a decimal to a percent, we move it two times to the right. That gets us 15%. All right, number eight. Given a single, fair, six-sided die with the numbers one, two, three, four, five, six on the faces, so just a regular die. What is the probability of the complement, so essentially complement is the not, okay, the complement of rolling a two? Express your answer as a simplified fraction. Always look to see what they want your probability expressed as. Like number seven, we found the probability of the fraction, but we need it as a percent, so we had to change it. Don't just leave it like this, because that's not answering the question fully. This one, we get to leave it like a fraction. So. The complement of rolling a two, so not rolling a two, essentially. So the probability of not rolling a two, so Mr. Saunders puts the line up there. Um, you may also see it like this, probability of not two, either or, um, is going to be, well, if I'm not rolling a two, that leaves me one, three, four, five, and six. So that's five out of six. 
and I cannot simplify this fraction, so that is my final answer. Number nine. Given this fair spinner, what is the probability of landing on a number less than six if you spin one time? Express your answer as a simplified fraction. So I need all the numbers less than six. So that's going to be five, four, three, two, and one. So that is five out of eight possible options. Remember, it's the number of desired out of over number of possible. So I desire every number less than six, so that's five of them, one, two, three, four, five. Out of the total possible, well, there's eight possible options here. So the probability, sorry, you should always write it this way. Um, make sure you write the probability so we know what five-eighths represents of getting a number that is less than six is five-eighths. Okay? Number 10. Mrs. Ramirez's eighth grade English class has 24 students, 14 of which are boys. If she randomly chooses one student to read a section, a section of text aloud, what's the probability that student is a girl? Express your answer as a simplified fraction. Well, I know Ms. Ramirez has 24 students in her class and 14 of them are boys. So if I subtract those two numbers, that will tell me how many girls there are. So. There are 10 girls out of a possible 24. So the probability that it's a girl is 10 out of 24, but I want to simplify my fraction. So let's divide by two, and I get five out of 12. Number 11, a bag is full of poker chips, 25 red, 25 blue, and 50 white. If a student reaches into the bag and pulls out one chip, this is a simple event, I'm doing one thing, it's simple, what is the probability that that chip is red or white? So first off, it's the number of possible over, I'm sorry, the number desired <laughs> over the number of possible. So I desire a red or a white. Well, if I look up here, there's 25 red and 50 white. So 20, excuse me, 25 plus 50 is 75. So 75 is my top number. And the, pos the number possible would be all the chips in the bag. So 25 plus 25 is 50 plus another 50 is 100. So the probability of pulling a red or a white is 75 out of 500. Excuse me. And it doesn't say that you have to simplify out of 500, sorry, 100. Silly Miss Clickman. Doesn't say you have to simplify, but I always simplify. So um, let's divide both of these by 25. Um, how many quarters fit in 75 cents? Three. How many quarters fit in a dollar? Four. Final answer, three-fourths. Number 12. A survey was taken from 40 Tippett Middle School students regarding their favorite ice cream. The responses are shown below. Given this data, how many servings of strawberry ice cream should be prepared for 175 students? Express your answer to the nearest whole number. So what this question is asking me to do is predict how many students should like strawberry when I have a larger number? So when I'm making a prediction, that equals a proportion. Prediction equals proportion. And I'm going to be solving for x. So x will be my answer. It's not going to be a fraction. It's not asking for the probability. I'm making a prediction and solving for x. So whatever I get for x will be my answer. All right, so I'm looking for strawberry ice cream. Well, if I look here, I know that per this data, there's a total of 40, and six out of the 40 like strawberry ice cream. If I were to make a prediction, how many like strawberry ice cream out of 175 students? I can set up my proportion and then solve. So um, we'll do it like Mr. Saunders does. 
okay? 40 times x is 40x, and then 175 times 6, 6 times 5 is 30, 6 times 7 is 42, plus 3 is 45, 6 times 1 is 6, plus 4 is 10. So that's 1,050. Now you know how to solve a one-step equation. We're going to cut it in half. We're going to isolate the variable. So to get x by itself, we're going to do the opposite of operation of what's happening here. So this is 40 times x. The opposite of multiplying by 40 is dividing by 40. What I do to one side, I have to do to the other. These 40, 40s cancel because they're inverse operations. That leaves me with x on this side. And I need to do the division here, 1050 divided by 40. So 1050 divided by 40. I'm going to round to the nearest whole number, okay? So 40 will not go into 1, it will not go into 10, but it will go into 105 two times. That's 80. And you subtract, you get 25. Bring down your zero. 40 goes into 250. I look at 4 into 25. So that's 6 times. That would be 240. Subtract, you get 10. I need to keep going, so I'm going to add a decimal, take it up, and a zero. Bring down my zero. How many 40s fit in 100? Well, that would be 2, which would be 80. I could keep going, but since I need to round to the nearest whole number, I only need one decimal. So 26.2 is what I can use to get my whole number answer. So I'm rounding to the nearest whole number. The 2 does not make the 6 go up. So x equals 26. Number 13. After completing her entertainment center, Elise decided to build a new custom footlocker. She made a list of her options as follows. Excuse me. The footlocker could be 12 cubic feet or 18 cubic feet. It could have one or three partitions. The wood could be poplar or cherry. And the finish could be paint or satin. So notice when I have multiple options here, I highlighted them in different colors so I can uh, kind of visually pull those out and separate them. What's the probability that she randomly chooses 18 cubic feet, three partitions, cherry wood, and stain? This is not a simple event. It's not one thing happening. It's multiple things happening. So this is a compound event. So that's when I take my fractions or my probabilities and I multiply them together. I compound them. So the probability of choosing 18 cubic feet, three partitions, cherry wood finish, I'm sorry, cherry wood and a stain finish is as follows. What's the probability of choosing 18 cubic feet? Well, it's either 12 or 18, so one out of two. What's the probability of choosing three partitions? Well, it's either one or three, so that's one out of two. Cherry, there's only two options, so one out of two. And then stain, there's only two options, so another one out of two. I'm going to take these fractions and multiply them all together. 1 times 1 times 1 times 1 is 1. 2 times 2 is 4. 4 times 2 is 8. And 8 times 2 is 16. You need to see that. It's 16. This cannot be simplified. It does tell me to express my answer as a simplified fraction. So 1 16 is my final answer. Okay. Moving on to number 14. Given the fair spinner shown below, you and a friend are going, each going to spin one time. What is the probability that you land on an odd number and your friend lands on a two? So I'm not just doing one thing here. This is not a simple event. There's more than one thing, so it's a compound event. So the probability of me landing on an odd and my friend landing on a 2. Well, if I'm looking at all the odd numbers, that's all these black sections right here, 1, 3, 5, 7. So the probability of me landing on an odd is 4 out of 8. And then the probability of my friend landing on a 2 is 1 out of a total of 8. So to find the compound probability of these, I'm going to multiply them together. But we want to work smarter, not harder. So let's simplify any fractions we can. 4 eighths will simplify to 1 half. 1 eighth is already simplified. So I'm just going to bring those down. 
Now I can multiply. 1 times 1 is 1. 2 times 8 is 16. I can't simplify that fraction. So that's my final answer because they want my answer as a simplified fraction. Number 15. In the Monopoly game, there are two regular schmegular number cubes, so plain old number cubes, dice. What is the probability that you roll two sixes on your first roll? So I'm looking for a six. If I had a dice and I rolled it, I'm trying to land on a six. So express your answer as a simplified fraction, super important. So the probability that I roll a six and then another six. So two different events happening. What's the probability that I roll a six on the first die? Well, that's one out of six. There's only one six on a number die. And then the prob probability that I roll another six, okay, is another one out of six, because there's only one six on a number die. And then I'm gonna take these two events and I'm gonna multiply them together. These are already in simplest form, so I'm just gonna go ahead and multiply. One times one is one. 6 times 6 is 36. This fraction is simplified, so that's my final answer. Number 16, state that the following is a dependent or independent event. Okay, so remember, you, I always ask myself, does the second thing depend on the first thing? Okay, so match five numbers in a lottery drawing. Well, if I pull a number or I pick a number in the lottery, say it's number 4. The probability that I'm going to pick a number four in the second draw depends on the first draw because the second draw, I need a four and that depended on the number I drew the first time. So this is dependent. Number, number B, excuse me, letter B. Roll one die, flip one coin, then roll a second die. So if I look at this, this die, what I roll here, doesn't depend on what I flipped on the coin. The coin doesn't depend on what I rolled on the die. So since none of these depend on each other, these are independent events. Letter C, draw two marbles from a bag without replacement. Okay, so if I draw one marble from the bag, the probability that, and I don't put it back, the probability that I'm gonna draw um, a second marble of the same color depends on what I drew the first time. If I took a blue out, now I change the probability in the, flat, in the bag. So when you do not replace something, that is automatically dependent because what you pull the second time depends on what you pulled the first time. D says randomly pick the jack of spades from a deck of cards in one pick. So I'm only picking one time, so nothing depends on anything else. Like the jack of spades is there and it's not removed or anything like that. So this is independent. Okay, number 17. What is the probability of randomly pulling two aces from a regular schmegular deck of playing cards? I'm going to stop myself right here. I know there are 52 cards in a deck. Ever heard of the game 52 card pickup where you throw the whole deck of cards in the air? So that helps me remember 52 cards in a deck. All right, so what's the probability of randomly pulling two aces from a regular schmegular deck of playing cards in the following games? Express your answer in a simplified fraction. So we're gonna pull one card at a time, look at it and set it aside. So since I'm setting, aside, setting it aside, I am not replacing it. All right, so pull one card at a time. So I want the probability of pulling an ace and then another ace. That's what I'm looking for. And this is not replacing. All right, so the probability that I pull an ace, well, if you think about a deck of cards, there are four suits. There are jacks, spades, hearts, and diamonds. And there is an ace in each one of those suits. So. I have a total of four aces out of a deck of 52 cards, okay? Now, I do not replace the card that I pulled, so now my total has changed. So let's say I pulled this, um, what did I say here? Oh, spades, hearts, diamonds, and what am I missing? 
diamonds, hearts, spit. Uh, okay, let's say I pull the ace of hearts. So that's now gone. So now I have 51 cards left in the deck because I did not replace it. And now there's only three aces left. So the probability that I pull another ace is three out of 51. I recommend you draw yourself a picture, especially when you're not replacing things. Draw yourself a picture so you can physically change the numbers. Now, to find the compound probability of these two events, I'm going to multiply them together. But let's remember, let's work smarter, not harder. So let's simplify these fractions before we start multiplying. I know 4 out of 52 can both be divided by 4. So if I come down here, um, actually I'm going to come over here and redo it. That's going to be 1 out of 13. 4 divided by 4 is 1. 52 divided by 4 is 13. And then 3 out of 51, well, if you remember the, the trick to determine if a number is divisible by 3, you add all the digits together. I know 3 is divisible by 3. 5 plus 1 is 6. 6 can be divided by 3, so I know 51 can be divided by 3. So let's divide both of these by 3. 3 divided by 3 is 1. 51 divided by 3, I don't know off the top of my head. 3 goes into 5 one time. It's a remainder of 2. 3 goes into 21 7 times exactly, so that's 1 out of 17. Now that I have uh, simplified fractions, let's go ahead and multiply. Top times top, bottom times bottom. 1 times 1 is 1, and then I don't know 17 times 13, so let's do it. 3 times 7 is 21. 3 times 1 plus 2 is 5, add a 0. 1 times 7 is 7, and 1 times 1 is 1. We're going to add down. That's 1, that's 12, and that's 2. 1 over 221. This fraction is in simplest form, so I am done. That's a 1, FYI, sorry. All right. Um, B, for the same scenario, pull one card at a time, look at it, and return it to the deck. So this is replacing the card. Different than this one where I did not replace it. So um, probability of getting an ace and an ace. Well, I know the probability of picking the first ace. Let's say this uh, heart was still there. Okay. Um, was 4 out of 52. There are four possible aces in a deck of cards out of a total of 52. When I pulled, let's say, that ace of hearts the first time, okay, I replaced it back in the deck. So the total number of cards in the deck did not change. This guy is still here. So the probability that I'm going to pick an ace again is still 4 out of 52. I'm going to multiply these two fractions. But remember, we're going to work smarter, not harder. So I'm going to simplify them before I multiply. I already simplified 4 out of 52 up here. I know it's going to be 1 out of 13. This one is also going to be 1 out of 13. I'm going to multiply those two fractions together. Top times top, bottom times bottom. 1 times 1 is 1. 13 times 13, 3 times 3 is 9, 3 times 1 is 3, add a 0. 1 times 3 is 3, and 1 times 1 is 1. Add down, you get 9, 6, and 1. So that's 1 out of 169. If on any of these, like this right here, you did not simplify first, you can still get to this answer. You're just going to have really big numbers in your fraction. You're going to have to do a lot of simplifying at the end which leaves a lot of room for error. So recommend, our recommendation is that you simplify your fractions first before you compound them or multiply them together. All right, flip it over. Almost done, three more. Number 18, what is the probability of drawing one red chip out of a bag of 100 poker chips followed by a blue chip if the bag contains 25 red, 35 blue, and 40 white chips? You do not replace the first chip before drawing the second chip. So I'm going to write my, uh, my counts out here. I've got 25 red, I've got 35 blue, and 40 white. Remember how I said sometimes it helps you to draw a picture, so I'm just drawing it bigger out here. Okay, so the probability of drawing a red and then a blue without replacement, no replacement, okay, is... Well, the probability of drawing a red is going to be 25 out of the total 100. I do not put that chip back. So now, 
Since I drew a red, now I have 24 reds left. Well, if you notice, when you add those numbers together, you no longer get 100. I took the chip out, so now I have 99 chips. Okay, so my total has changed. Now, what's the probability that I draw a blue? Well, there's still 35 blues in there out of the total of 99. Okay, so again, we're going to work smarter, not harder, and we're going to simplify any fractions that we can before we multiply. I know that I can simplify 25 and 100 by 25. 25 divided by 25 is 1, and 100 divided by 25 is 4. Um, for 35 out of 99, I know this can't be divided by 2 because they're odd. Let's try the 3's trick. 5 plus 3 is 8. Well, that can be divided by 3, so I can just move on. I don't even need to check the second one. Um, it can't be divided by 4 if it can't be divided by 2. This one can be divided by 5, but this one cannot. 6's um, won't work on this one. 7's won't work. Neither will 8's or 9's. So, I'm just going to bring that down. And then I'm going to compound these or multiply them together. Top times top, bottom times bottom. 1 times 35 is 35. And then let's do 99 times 4. 4 times 9 is 36. 4 times 9 is 36, plus 3 is 39. So that's 396. I'll help you out right here and let you know this cannot be simplified anymore. So that is your final answer. Number 19, after 30 random numbers between 1 and 10 were generated with a free online program, the following data was collected. Do you think there's a problem with this random number generator? Why or why not? I absolutely think there's a problem with this because there is only 30 random numbers generated. That is not enough experiments to give us accurate data. That's why this is all over the place. So the problem with this, I would say yes, there is a problem. because not enough experiments were conducted. Oops. There is no way to get an accurate representation of the amount of numbers generated with a number this small. Like if you're hitting like five, 100,000, 100,000, that's a large amount. So your theoretical and experimental probability should even out. And these numbers would be a lot more even all the way across. So if they were all even, I would say that they were A-OK -okay, um, and there was not a problem with it. But this is all over the place because you only did it 30 times. So that, that's not enough experiments in order to tell properly. Okay, last one, number 20. So number 20 says, in a survey of 80 middle school and high school kids conducted at the local mall, the following data was collected about their favorite subjects in school. Based on the survey, predict, making predictions, so that's a proportion, prediction, proportion. Predict how many students a tippet would choose band, so here's band, as their favorite subject. Assume that Tippett has 500 students. Express your answer to the nearest whole number of students. All right, so um, you probably can't see up here, but on your paper, this says 12.5%. Well, when we set up a proportion, it's part over whole. That part is not a percent. So we have to change, or we have to figure out what the part is based on this percent. So what we're gonna do is we are gonna take 12.5%, and we are going to change that percent to a decimal. Now, I know you may be saying, Ms. Clickman, there's already a decimal there, but this is a percent. You can't just erase a percent sign. That's not how that works. To change a percent to a decimal, you actually have to move a decimal point. So since there's already one here, I'm going to use it, and I'm going to move it two times to the left. This is now 0 0.125. This is the decimal form of this percent. You cannot just erase the percent sign. You have to actually move the decimal in order to drop the percent sign. So now I'm gonna take 0.125 and I'm gonna multiply it by the whole or the total number of students that were surveyed, so 80. 
All right, zero times five is zero, zero times two is zero, zero times one is zero, add a zero. Eight times five is 40, eight times two is 16, plus four is 20, and eight times one is eight, plus two is 10. So I get 10,000, but since I multiply with decimals, I have to move my decimal point at the end. There's one, two, three numbers behind a decimal, so one, two, three. That gets me 10.000, which is the same thing as the whole number 10. So 10 students, that 12.5% represents 10 students out of the 80. So those are the numbers I'm going to use here. 10 students out of 80, like band. Now, let's use this to make a prediction for 500 students. So how many would that be out of 500 students? We're going to solve our proportion by doing our butterfly. 80 times x is 80x. 500 times 10 is 5,000. Okay, you're multiplying by 10, so just add an extra zero on the end. Okay, I can write it over here just to help you remember what we did. That's 5,000. Okay, now to solve this one step equation, we cut it in half. We're going to isolate the variable, so we need to get x by itself, so I need to do the opposite of what's happening here. x is being multiplied by 80, so the opposite of that is dividing by 80. What I do to one side, I have to do to the other. These cancel because they're inverse operations. And now I need to actually do 5,000 divided by 80. 80 won't go into 5 or 50, but it goes into 500, okay, uh, six times. 80 times 6 is 480. You can just come over here and pick numbers to multiply by until you get as close to 500 as possible without going over. 500 minus 480 is 20. Bring down your zero. 80 goes into 200 two times. That would be 160. That leaves me with 40. I need to keep going, so I'm going to add a decimal, take it up, then I can bring down a zero. 80 goes into 400 five times exactly. Okay, so I have x equals 62.5, but I need to round to the nearest whole number. So that's in the ones place. The five does indeed make that two go up, so x is going to equal 63 students. All right, and that is your review for the Chapter 7 test on probability, please remember that these questions are almost identical to the ones on your test. So if you know how to work these out, you will be just fine on your test.